Hello and welcome everybody. Now that we're done past the technical difficulties, technical difficulties, welcome to our monthly program for Cannabis Lab. I'm the president of Cannabis Lab, the local chapter here in South Florida, Todd Rosales. Uh, we've got a great presentation for you guys tonight. We've been doing a lot of these monthly meetings where we'll do one virtually and one in person. Make sure everybody has a chance to participate and educate themselves amongst our groups. Of course, the virtual ones are a little bit more educational and our in-person events have a lot more networking aspect to them. So for those of you that happen to be located in South Florida, our next event is going to be next Thursday on the 25th at Opportunities in Delray Beach, Florida. If you guys wanna come out and check out a live event, there'll be networking, there'll be a live panel on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the cannabis space. It's gonna be amazing. It is anchored by our own education chair, Aisha Alves. So it is definitely one you wanna check out. So that's gonna be in Delray Beach, Florida at Opportunities next Thursday, the 25th. If you want more information on that, you can check it out at um, just Google Eventbrite Cannabis Lab or join clab.com. Either way, you'll be able to register for that event. Uh, we have a podcast airing tomorrow at 2 p.m. with Frank Costa about insurance in the cannabis space. That's going to be a great one. Uh, so those are some of the things that we have coming up. Tonight, we have an amazing panel. So, you know, part of the biggest things with cannabis is government relations because they're the ones who control everything that we do. It is a schedule one substance. It is governed by local governmental bodies. Um, and the gentlemen that we have on our panel tonight are going to walk you through what is gone on, what is going on, and the things that you need to pay attention to when it comes to dealing with the government as far as a schedule one substance. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to the, uh, the last sitting president of C-Lab, my friend, and one of the managing directors of Florida for Care, Eric Stevens. Eric? Take it away. The panel's yours tonight, man. Todd, thank you. And uh, thank you to my guests that were able to join. Um, you know, I think this is a, a great topic in relation to government relations at the state and federal level. Um, we've got two great guests who, who I'll introduce um, joining us. And, and really, the, the purpose of this is kind of to dive into a little bit more of a discussion of what's going on, uh, what's going on right now and what may be coming up in the future uh, at both the state and uh, and local level. So um, without further ado, um, we have Mr. Christian Bax with Bax & Associates, former VP of Government Affairs for Cookies, uh, as well as uh, Director of the Department of Health uh, for the state of Florida for a number of years, um, or Office of Medical Marijuana Use. Um, or its previous uh, Office of Compassionate Use. Uh, and then we also have David Mangone with the Liaison Group, uh, as well as with uh, National Cannabis Roundtable and NCR um, joining us. Um, they do a lot of work at the federal level. And so I think we'll be able to have a great perspective um, looking at you know both the local state and, and federal regulations, what's been going on and what, what may or may not be coming in the, in the near future. So, uh, Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, you know, if you if you want to give a little bit more of a background uh, on yourselves, feel free. Um, if not, we can kind of dive into the questions, Christian. Uh, well, thank you for having me, Eric. It's it's a pleasure to be on, um, and looking forward to the conversation. Obviously, it's it's a very dynamic sector still. There's a still a lot changing. Um, and I guess to your point, I was the director for the OMMU, so I worked for the government for quite a while, for, for three years, helping to build Florida's program. When I left, I started a, a law firm and a consulting company. Eventually, I went house in-house for uh, Cookies Retail and did their government affairs for a little over a year. And now I am a, uh, I, I work for a mergers and acquisition advisory service based out of London. And um, most most of my day is is M and I'm still doing some cannabis regulatory um, and legal stuff, but it's it's most of my work is now on the M and A side. But uh, very excited to be here. Thank you for hosting. Absolutely, thank you for joining us, David. You want to uh, give a little perspective of uh, kind of the liaison group, NCR, how you joined, etc., and then we'll kind of delve in. Sure, and, and thanks, Eric, for having me. So I'm the director of policy for the Liaison Group. Uh, it is a federal cannabis lobbying firm. All we do is cannabis policy um, at the federal level all the time. Um, 
is uh, through the liaison group, we represent the National Cannabis Roundtable, uh, leading trade association um, that has membership from multi-sib operators all the way down to single uh, retail licensees, as well as some ancillary businesses. Also represent the California Cannabis Industry Association on Capitol Hill, uh, Arizona Dispensary Association, and then some individual cannabis clients. Um, prior to the liaison group, I was the in-house counsel for Americans for Safe Access. Uh, and it's a nationwide nonprofit um, that represents medical cannabis patients. Um, so. Uh, have been in the cannabis space for about six and a half years now. Um, before that was on Capitol Hill, uh, working for the House Ways and Means Committee uh, as a legislative fellow. So uh, great to be here um, and appreciate the time. Fantastic. No, and I, I think that's a great perspective too. Um, I was last at the uh, state regulator conference and saw ASA and MPP and a few others there. Um, and I think that was a, a great opportunity um, to be able to, you know, have some conversations with a variety of, of different people from across, you know, the United States. So, uh, you know, uh, I kind of wanted to delve in. Obviously, you know, there's been some big changes um, across the state levels. You know, there's some states that have just recently passed medical laws. There's some states that have recently passed adult use laws. There's some states that are doing this legislatively. Mostly, they've been done previously via ballot initiative, which involves you know, a usually a high number of signatures um, that then get submitted and then voted on by the by the legislature. So, you know, I guess, what do you guys think are some of the, you know, maybe the one or two biggest changes that, that have happened over the past one or two years that you've seen and that are, that'll have kind of a future impact um, or we're just, you know, extremely remarkable? Are you, are you like asking about like a specific program step or like a macro? grow like meta step for the industry yeah i mean i think you know where was there either some state level policies that changed or you know increased was there a specific state that came online that you think will be a catalyst to moving you know things forward in a in a, in a nearer fashion or was there something negative that maybe occurred um that that's kind of set us back i think we'll get into some of the you know the federal bills that have been put forth and, and kind of how you know those have moved or not moved um but i but i kind of wanted to look at just kind of the overall perspective i don't think there's like you know there there was a, a you know a, for the for the bills that did pass there was something you know that you know they were looking into for research you know there were some additional licenses that were going to be allowed for that but there hasn't really been a ton as far as scheduling and other things like that so is there any particular state that you think you can point to any particular policy or letter that's come forth? Yeah, for I think for me, it's seeing New York um, move towards adult use, uh, you know, slowly, surely, we're still waiting on a lot of regulations, but licensing has started in that state for social equity applicants, um, sales look like they're still going to be on track start at the beginning of next year. Uh, I, I don't think we can understate the impact that New York's legalization will have on federal politics. Um, we have the Senate majority leader who's introduced a, a comprehensive cannabis bill, um, but New York is also the seat of where most of our banks are in the United States. So um, if the policy gets moving in New York and they start to figure out solutions in terms of uh, banking access and financing access, uh, I think that's the start of several dominoes as we look around the country that you know continue to have challenges on this issue. Um, that's what I would say, uh, but you know I think we can talk about the federal bills a little bit later on um, and the sort of the slow drip that, of legalization that we've been heading towards um, over the past couple of administrations. Um, so yeah, a, a couple things. I, I was actually going to say say New York. I think that's the the correct answer. And I think when we kind of look at this, look back at this in a decade, I think the state of New York coming online correct will be you know the most significant thing looking back. But so two other things that were interesting. One was the overlap of cannabis and COVID in the sense that, you know, we're in Florida medical states, like there was, there was a little bit of a policy shift. Very, very interesting. Um, I know 2020 seems like a decade ago, but having states that are, you know, purple, like Florida, for example, where cannabis is a, uh, you know, an essential business. Um, and that, you know, labs were, I mean, not labs, but dispensaries were allowed to stay open and, you know, rules were relaxed for more curbside service, 
for delivery in, in various jurisdictions. Like that was a pretty big watermark as far as just cementing the place of, of kind of cannabis dispensaries as like a, just a regular acceptable business. Um, I'm not talking about obviously like states like Colorado where that was already like very cemented, but it was in states that were still kind of getting used to it. I think it was a really big step forward. Um, and the other one from a public policy perspective is social equity in the sense that like, I don't think I had a single conversation with an elected official my entire time in house at GA at CRE where um, social equity didn't at least come up once. Like, uh, and I, it, it's very, very important like to note how significant that was because like in the early days, like you're talking 2016, 2017, 2018, like you go in and you talk to elected officials, it was about testing, kids eating edibles, um, pesticide problems, diversion, and like social equity has, is, t has taken up a huge portion of those conversations. So like it's better or worse, you just, it, it is absolutely impossible to ignore in the industry now. <clears throat> For sure. And I think I think that's a, a really good point by both of you. I mean, I think we saw that here in Florida and, you know, uh, our accolades to the governor and, and, you know, all of his staff and the leaders of the department for making sure that, you know, we did get those essential businesses and that that was able to move forward. You know, there was some telehealth uh, for current patients and some other things that have, have expired, but you know, they, they worked. We have examples of them and now, you know, there's, I think it's a little bit easier to have some of those conversations um, with different legislators and, and it's become a little bit more normalized. So I, I think that, that that's definitely been helpful. Um, you know, I think if we want to get into kind of the federal reforms, um, you know, I think the social equity aspect too um, has been, you know, as much as you've been hearing it probably in, the, in different state levels, uh, at the federal level too, it started to have, uh, I, I think it already was uh, trending and having a, a, a large impact, but I think that that's, I, I've noticed that more consistently being discussed um, and actually people, you know, putting a stake in the ground saying we either get this or that kind of, kind of messaging. So, you know, could you discuss a little bit about some of the bills that have been out there, um, whether it's for, you know, expungements, whether it's for, um, you know, actually, you know, reforming, whether it's for uh, banking, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, and then maybe some of the, the roadblocks that, that there've been to get those federal reforms. Well, what would someone would look at and think was a pretty favorable uh, you know, setup of legislators in, 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 in DC. Yeah. And so, at least on the social justice and the equity side, there's really two sort of categories of bills that have come out um, in Congress. You have your comprehensive legalization bills, um, like the Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment Act um, that's passed the House um, now two times. It creates a trust fund within the Department of Justice that creates grant programming uh, for these states to develop programs and training uh, when it comes to reentry for folks impacted by the war on drugs. Um, I think the comparable version that we have seen uh, a lot of headlines around is Majority Leader Schumer's um, Cannabis Administration and Opportunity Act. Uh, that was sort of a year and a half in the making. They put out a discussion draft last summer, um, took in stakeholder feedback and released uh, about a 300 page bill um, at the end of July. Uh, you know, both of those bills you know, are really, really focused on um, remediating a lot of the harms of the war on drugs. They do record sealing, they create expungements, uh, they create opportunity funds for individuals who are, um, you know, impacted by the war on drugs looking to enter into the industry. Um, but that being said, they are incredibly big in their scope and scale. And I think ultimately unlikely to get to the president's staff in the, the current Congress. Uh, I would say the other sort of more narrower scope on the criminal justice and social equity side um, deal specifically with expungements. Um, so there's two proposals right now. Um, one is the, the HOPE Act led by David Joyce um, and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Um, the HOPE Act provides grant money for state level expungements. Um, and you know that is, I think, the overwhelming uh, prison population that we're looking at when we're talking about um, folks who have been incarcerated. It's, you, know, you have hundreds of thousands of the state level um, and then the federal uh, prisoners who are still incarcerated for cannabis offenses, you know, it's probably around 
2,700 to 3,000. Um, outside of the HOPE Act, uh, you also have a bill um, that's introduced by Troy Carter out of Louisiana. Uh, it's called the Marijuana uh, Misdemeanor Expungement Act. Um, there's no federal process for marijuana expungements right now. Um, so that bill looks to uh, rectify that um, in a much more narrow way than the Cannabis Administration Opportunity Act um, or the MORE Act. So I think there's been some chatter uh, when it comes to a piece of legislation like safe banking that's viewed largely as a bill that is um, helpful to industry by some of the progressive members of Congress that safe banking needs to be paired uh, with some of this expungement language, some of this criminal justice language. Um, you know, earlier this month, Senator Cory Booker out of New Jersey said that uh, a safe banking plus uh, bill was possible at the end of this Congress. Um, but he is looking for criminal justice reforms to be added into uh, that that sort of banking bill. Um, so I, I will stop there in terms of the, you know, equity and, and justice provisions, but you're absolutely right, it has been a um, central focus of the, the cannabis reform discussion on the federal level. Um, and what we've seen, at least with um, Democratic majority in the House and then uh, the Democratic leadership in the Senate, that they really want to prioritize uh, equitable access to the industry and really want to prioritize these criminal justice reforms as part of any uh, federal cannabis package. Yeah, and I think that was somewhat, you know, changed, you know, I think there was a, a few different levels of, of items that, that Senator Booker was looking for originally. It seems like, you know, hopefully if there could be a balance to get something done because of this, you know, the stalemate, it, that seems to be something leaving the perspective and we'll kind of get into who's kind of leading those discussions. I think you already mentioned some of them in David Joyce and others. Um, you know, we've got, you know, a member of the Cannabis Caucus from, from the state of Florida here, right? And I think we need to all be, uh, at least two of us are, 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 you know, residents here. So, uh, you know, there's obviously a bunch of our, our membership is, is based here. So, you know, I think we need to be thinking about those people who we should be, you know, uh, working with, getting behind, giving them some examples of people that they can know in their areas. Um, Etc. So, uh, you know, I think. Do Do you think that that, you know, anything federally will occur before the election? And and if it doesn't, um, is there sometime soon after? Like, is there a better time or not? Right? Because then we're getting into the twenty twenty four times, uh, and so it could get a little little interesting. And I think. As, as supportive as, as some of these things are, especially medical, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem to lead to, you know, last minute action uh, by a lot of these legislators. So I'm, I'm kind of, I, I'm a bit pessimistic as far as the, like the short term upside, I guess, politically in the sense that um, I think that there's probably a lot of work that can still be done at the state level, but, but like, it's really hard for me to like, to like, I mean, just to put it bluntly, the last two years was an abject failure by the Democrats who controlled the presidency, the House and the Senate to actually cram something down. So, I mean, it was kind of a mean issue. It's generally popular. It's something that a lot of the Democrats ran on when they, when, I mean, some Republicans ran on it as well. And like, if there was an opportunity for the Democrats to get a program the way they want it, and they actually took it seriously, there would have, you would have seen, I think, more compromise. I think Biden is probably an issue where I, I you know, it, it, he's kind of a, a, a mystery box on this issue where, you know, you hear that he's not potential, you're not really certain if he's steadfastly against it. He's just kind of not paying attention to it. His people aren't for it. His people are for it. You hear conflicting things, but I mean, but ultimately it didn't get done, right? And so now you're in a situation where it seems pretty likely the Republicans are gonna take the House. And so at the very least, you're gonna have a split Congress. The Republicans also take the Senate. It's hard for me to believe that a Democrat minority is gonna let the Republicans have a smooth ride to any, any you know, track, any track that allows them to kind of own that issue 
Um, and God forbid in 2024, the, the last thing the Democrats are going to want is for a Republican president to sign a legalization bill. So it's like you have this very, uh, this very strong protracted conflict between pretty equal situated opponents. And the Congress has shown me nothing in, in, in its recent history that they're willing to come together for like kind of a pragmatic, reasonable solution to this issue. It seems like everything is such a cluster. Everything is so adversarial between the two. Um, something either something very bad or something very ha good has to come happen in order for this to be a catalyst or, or the industry has to throw a ton of money in order to get those people interested from, a, from an advocacy perspective. <clears throat> yeah, I... I, I... I wouldn't say that I'm pessimistic, but uh, I think getting something workable done by the end of the year is a really big challenge. I will say both chambers um, have passed a research bill. Uh, the research bill does not um, you know, really do anything as far as the industry is concerned. It just streamlines the process with the DEA in terms of getting a schedule one license. Um, but this would be, in theory, the first standalone cannabis bill to go to the president's desk um, since the Controlled Substances Act. Um, so Chuck Schumer in a uh, sort of statement of accomplishments um, that he, he put out as he headed into campaign season this August included that research bill um, that the Senate passed by unanimous consent as a, as a historical step um, that the Senate had taken. Um, you know, when you look at the research bill compared to his larger CAOA bill, um, the research bill does essentially nothing uh, that he wants to do in his larger legislation. And so for him to herald this as a, you know, a major milestone and a historic win, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit surprising. Uh, but that being said, you know, I, I do think there is an appetite um, for, for something to be done by the end of the year by the Democrats. They are looking at, um, as Christian mentioned, a, a likely flip in, in one, if not both chambers. Um, and if they get a flip in both chambers, they're going to pack in every priority they can into end of year bills, um, both the National Defense Authorization Act um, and end of year omnibus bill, uh, the reauthorization of, of any tax provisions that are coming up at the end of this year, because they're not going to want Joe Biden to legislate with executive order for the next two years. So there's often a phrase in D.C. that these end of year bills are, are Christmas tree bills. Um, they include all sorts of uh, priorities parties of the governing and ruling party that this year, um, regardless of the outcome of the election, I think Democrats are going to try to load up these bills with as many um, provisions, both cannabis and not as they possibly can, uh, to try to move that forward by the end of the year. How much impact on that do you think, um, like, if, if Biden actually, like, used the bully pulpit to get out there and actually just had kind of like a Tony Stark and Iron Man one moment or behind the microphone where he's like, I'm, I'm now making this, you know, this is a very big deal to me. I want Congress in the next two months to send something on my desk to legalize marijuana. That, like, do you think that that would change anything if he, act, if the old man actually stepped up and like took a firm position one way or the other? Um, I think it would help a lot with the older moderate Democrats who haven't really had to take a position on this issue. They've been rank and file voters um, with whatever their leadership has told them, but they haven't necessarily been out there, you know, on the steps of a dispensary um, calling for reform. You know, you do have some politicians who are, who are in Congress right now um, who really have sort of championed this issue and have for a long time. You know, guys like um, Earl Blumenhauer from Oregon, uh, you know, has really like understood the issue and been out there vocally, um, you know, advocating for it, but that's not the norm for, you know, either Republicans or Democrats. I think if you had Biden out here saying, you know, let's get this done, um, you know, much like he did with, with infrastructure um, and, and this Inflation Reduction Act, I think it would motivate some members who may not have been taking a position beforehand to get out there in front of this issue. But when you look at the leadership, particularly on the House side, um, you have a lot of individuals who are in there um, you know, late 70s, early 80s. Um, so the same sort of demographic and, you know, age of Biden coming from sort of the, the just say no camp and the 1994 crime bill have plenty of members in Congress who, you know, signed that bill, voted for that bill, um, and argued for that bill, um, who are still sort of making the decisions on some of the leadership positions, uh, particularly on the House side. Um, 
you know, certainly uh, you look at the average age of the Senate as well. I think it's um, upwards of 65. Uh, and there's definitely a generational shift that you've seen um, within politicians in Congress. A lot of folks uh, who are, you know, the, the younger Gen X millennial politicians have no problem with legalization on both sides of the aisle. Uh, when you get into some of the older politicians, it is a longstanding generational issue that they have a tough time overcoming. So um, I'll put that out there for what it's worth. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, I think we heard a lot from the Biden administration before the election, at least on criminal justice reform and, and expungements and, um, and even still now calling on, you know, people to be released from jail from other countries and, and you know, Brittany Griner, etc. Um, hopefully there's some catalyst. I, I also, you know, thought it was good to see Senator Booker's comments and, you know, still a little bit pessimistic based on what has gone on in the past. But, you know, I hope that they actually, for some of the reasons that you all just mentioned, um, you know, maybe can push this forward. And so, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be an interesting time now. And, and if nothing goes on, I think it's obviously not going to be helpful. And, you know, then eventually we're going to be into presidential season soon. So it's, uh, I don't know, what, what other industries do you think have done a better job? Obviously, there's a variety that we can point to um, that have been established around for a long time. Or, or what do you think are, you know, two or three things that, that have been lacking from um, the cannabis perspective that, you know, I think maybe some of that void has been started to be filled by some of the industry groups there. Um, but, but, but I guess what, what do you think is still, you know, missing? Uh, Money. <laughs> yeah. I, I I was gonna say organized. I was gonna say organized political giving, but it, it is. It's money. It's you know we are a multi-billion-dollar industry, um, and we are yet to act like it um, in our federal advocacy and our political advocacy. And you know I think we get a lot of parallels, um, at least in the regulations, to both alcohol uh, and and tobacco, um, but. You know, those are industries that we don't necessarily want to be regulated like, uh, and we should be out there calling for the difference between us as a regulated product and them. Um, I like to analogize sort of where we are with the cannabis industry, um, with how we came to regulate motor vehicles. You know, up until 1966, there wasn't any sort of federal standard or federal bill that was passed for the auto industry. It was all state by state regulation. Um, and this included things like DUIs and included things like emission standards. Um, and then you had the National Highway Safety Act in 66. And that was the first effort in really 50 years of an industry existing by the federal government to sort of consolidate everything under one roof. Um, I think we're on a similar pathway right now. You have a lot of well thought out and not so well thought out regulations put forward by the states, but we are, it feels like um, a pretty far way away from any sort of comprehensive federal paradigm that addresses things like safety um, and, you know, consumer labeling and packaging. Uh, it, it, it seems like that is, and, and you know, pardon the expression, like a pipe dream um, right now, uh, because Congress can't even agree on some of the most, the basic components of, of what we need. Um, but yeah. Yeah. And I, I think your, your point about the alcohol and tobacco, uh, is like, it's absolutely spot on, uh, in, in the sense that, because, so what I was going to use for like, if, if just a, as a comparison is, you know, two others that we get compared with, which is like big ag and pharma, which like marijuana as an industry, we're not, we're not going to come anywhere close to touching the, the numbers that those that both of those industries put into lobbying. Um, but alcohol, I mean, alcohol, that, that type of level is something that we should be aspire, aspire to in the sense of, of having a roughly comparable um, industry size. But so it's not just writing the checks, but the, ch the checks are very important, not just because they, you know, money is the lifeblood of politics. When you fund, when you're making donations to either PACs or candidates, you're helping to ensure or at least improve the, the election chances of those candidates who ostensibly you like, who also you are assuming that they're, those people are going to be more friendly than not um, to your industry. Um, the second 
is political organization in the sense of like the it's not just associations, right? Because there are cannabis associations. One, one of the problems that you run into, especially at the state level, is you'll have an association, but then all of the other major players hire very powerful, successful lobbyists as well. So you'll have your association head who will get into a room with you know five or six MSO lobbyists, and they're the fifth or sixth most important person in that room because these other lobbyists are, if they don't listen, like if, if the chair of an association says something that these guys don't like, it completely t- takes all the air out of their sails. If that one or two of those big, successful, powerful lobby shops that the MSOs are paying goes around the, that chairwoman or chairman and contradicts them, because now the member doesn't know, you know, who they're supposed to be listening to, it becomes a muddled mess. Um, so, like that's a that's a big thing. And then also, I would say the the third thing is just seriousness: is that you have probably not as many as we need organizations that actually like aren't just, you know, writing a couple checks, but are like very serious about um, having good people and actually putting real resources behind building relationships with electeds and with regulators and actually being able to impact the political process. And every industry that we've mentioned does it better than cannabis right now like alcohol, tobacco, more organized, although the tobacco is, it's not been a very good few years for them. Well, and I, I think that, you know, what we've been able to see is, you know, it, I think, I think there's obviously been an increase, but it hasn't been anywhere near the level that it, that it needs to be. And I think, you know, it's, it's good to see a little bit more happening, but I think for the most part, it's been you know, a, a lot of funding has gone from the larger organizations into state level ballot initiatives um, that get things passed. Um, and for the most part, they aren't even around after they pass for implementation. They've kind of moved on to the next state. Um, and so there's kind that's of- That's a really a, good point. There's kind or of they a, moved on to another business. You know, like that, that's, that's one of the, like one of the things is like some of these bigger MSOs that are actually putting real money into advocacy. It's because they've, they've had several years of, of building real companies. And I'll tell you who don't donate the pump and dump guys, the guys who like the, just the pure license flippers, the guys who are coming in, who are kind of like the, the Canabro dudes that like, where you can smell that it's kind of a fishy company from a mile away. Those people don't put real money into government spending because I think my my mic may have just dead, but um, can you hear me still? Yeah. Okay. They don't put real money into it because it's it that's that's like a serious thing, and they're not really thinking about serious long term things. They're thinking about how can we get in and flip in the next you know six to eighteen months and make X amount of dollars off of the the money that we put into it. Whereas the the real kind of serious MSOs that have been building infrastructure and have like real real money, real resources, like actual businesses at stake. Those are the people who take government seriously because it they, they, they have to, they're in it for the long game. Yeah, no, and I, I, I think, you know, we see most companies and industries, you know, that are regulated devoting a you know, certain portion of what they do and make towards government regulation or government affairs, or, you know, sometimes they may have somebody internally they, most of them now are, you know, at the level that this is becoming, have somebody internally, they may have a few people outside of that in, in each state, uh, and that they may, some of them may just have one in each state, but, um, and then they may also be involved with some associations and, and other groups, it's kind of, you know, the general sense of, of kind of what I've, what I've noticed, but I think there's, yeah, I think there's been a lack of that continuous, um, you know, information and, and action. Um, David, I think your group has done well. Uh, Michael Bronson with Attach, yeah. you know, I think he's done a great job. He wasn't able to join us, but. Um, I mean, we, I, I, I would add there's a lack of consistency with messaging too, which is a, it's a big problem for the industry right now. Um, you go to Capitol Hill and they say, what can we do for you? What is the fix for the industry? And they're hearing they're hearing 280E, they're hearing banking, they're hearing uh, access to capital markets, they're hearing, um, you know, create a fair and equitable licensing program. They're like, make sure you deal with testing standards too. And staff is basically like, well, 
figure out what you want and come back to us um, as an industry. And you know, this is not to say that every aspect of the industry always has to be on the same page with every issue, but I, I think there is a sense that the industry is is really disjointed in presenting what it needs and what it wants to lawmakers and regulators, um, because there there are so many different voices entering into the conversation. Um, you know, I, I think the you know diversity of opinions and groups is great, but there I think the critique that we receive back from the hill is like we can't help you get what you want until you know what you want. Um, so I think refining messaging um, as an industry as a whole is really, really important, especially as we look to a Republican Congress who may start at a point where they're less friendly um, to you know, the issue and to the industry as a whole um, than, than we may perceive the Democrats to be. Yeah, and I think, you know, to, to some of Christian's points too, you know, I think for some of the people that have gotten licenses, maybe just flip them aren't planning and in being involved are hoping to just have legalization pass and, and sell out from there. I mean, maybe they aren't as involved, uh, but to me, I, I can't necessarily understand that because they're still being regulated now. If you want those changes to happen, um, I don't know, none of the other laws that got passed changed on their own. Uh, they had to be done by someone in some form or fashion, right? And so I think, you know, it, it's it's odd when I see acquisitions of, you know, you know, six, seven, eight figure, you know what I mean? And, you know, even just in, in my own state, forget, you know, across the country versus what I see go from any of those groups into ballot initiatives uh, or even into political giving. I mean, uh, I don't know if there's any specific totals you have and how they compare, but I've seen them comparatively to the other industries and they're like not even a fraction of like 1% barely, it seems to me. Um, That's right. Yeah. And that, I mean, and you're, you're in a situation too, where there's this misconception that like true leaves, secure leaves, the heirs, like these public companies that they're, they're, they're going to take care of it, right? They're going to fund the government advocacy. They're going to, you know, they're going to push the envelope forward with the, the, with legislators and that like everyone else can kind of sit back and wait. But the thing is, is like, even as big as those companies are, like without, without to David's point, like consolidating messaging and without kind of a united front from the industry, like, and, and the rest of the industry kind of financially, contributing like that's just it it's not material enough to really make because like you can write checks right you you can go to these fundraisers you can talk to these politicians but like there's a there's different tiers of being on their radar and being able to have a conversation which is actually being able to like impact policy which is then also being able to like dictate policy and like we're still operating at the kind of the friends and family approach to politics rather than like the serious money serious influence um, and that takes time. That's like old growth forest. You that takes years, sometimes decades, to build those relationships over and build mutual trust. Um, and it, 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 to David's point, it takes commitment and consistency in order to build that type of influence. Yeah, and I yeah, think. And, and I, was, I, I was just going to add. I have some of this the spending numbers um, from twenty twenty one, and this is this is open secrets. You know, anyone can look it up. Uh, so. The industry as a as a whole spent 4.2 million with an M million with an M in in 2021. Um, when you look at the other organizations that were not just cannabis specific, so you know the ACLU, the Leadership Conference, um, you know sort of these justice centered organizations where uh, cannabis may be part of their portfolio, they combined spent 31.1 million on the MORE Act alone. So for the, the cannabis industry to be classified, you know, spending less than $5 million when there are industries on Capitol Hill that spend billions and billions into their government affairs program, like it, it's no wonder that like we are not greeted the same way that the oil industry or the auto industry or, um, you know, the refined plastics industry is like it is you looking looking at that spend it is you know completely disproportionate to the size and scale of the cannabis industry nationwide compared to what they are spending um on, yeah on and i mean each of our ballot initiative costs more than that right and and that collectively that 
is the total is it's got to be frustrating. You've also got those guys that are beating up like the the so the industries that we've mentioned, right? Just specifically comp- in comparison, big ag, pharma, tobacco, alcohol. All of those guys have associations. All of those guys have lobbyists, and many of them have consultants and lobbyists they're paying right now to help them plan and strategize for how to enter and take advantage of the cannabis industry. Like these guys are not just sitting back and going to like passively let this opportunity for, for, you know, horizontal growth into other, into another channel of business, just pass them by. And so there, there is a definitive opportunity cost, not just of, of time, but of allowing other industries to, to, kind of subtly and covertly start chipping away at members right now get their chits like they're they're working the game right now also to be able to enter um so i mean like just the establishment right now in cannabis it it can't sit on their laurels because there are bigger fish that are waiting to eat them as well yeah no i think i mean i think that's a really good point i think a lot of i think a lot of these companies have obviously started smaller And they've been more focused at the state level, right? Like that probably doesn't take into account all the state related uh, spending, et cetera. And I think because of the election cycles and because these things change so often, and because of the youth, I guess, of, 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 of cannabis, there's been a lack of that. Um, But it doesn't seem where they're doing all this M&A, they're doing all these other things that, that this hasn't matured in, in, a similar fashion to me at least um you know unless it's that they don't necessarily plan to you know be involved in it at that point um and they're so busy and you know fine with how things are that you know uh that could be fine um if you guys want to weigh in on you know I, I know we don't know maybe there'll be a new department created maybe there'll be you know a variety of things that could go on um but what are some of those ways that 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 things could be you know uh change drastically right like obviously in some states when it goes from medical to adult use there's things that change there's businesses that existed or locations of retails and other things and where they could be that that may change or not but i guess you know if 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 rescheduling were to happen you know if if there's different levels of of where this could or could not go um you know from those other industries that are going to have that opportunity to potentially hop in and i think we've got you know, one or two questions from the uh, from the audience. Yeah, and I, I'm going to start, and I'm gonna, I think I'm going to address one of the questions that's come in. Um, you get the federal government involved in the regulation of cannabis. How medical programs operate uh, under their current current state paradigms is going to completely and fundamentally change. Um, anything that the FDA touches is going to have you know really rigorous clinical trial standards. Um, You will not be able to make any medical claims without the FDA's approval. Um, They've already sent warning letters to CBD companies as well as cannabis companies. You know, having the FDA involved, you know, may be be good on the consumer and patient safety side, but in terms of the process to bring a product to market, if you have to go through, you know, pre-market approvals with the FDA and clinical trials to say um, whatever strain is good for whatever um, medical ailment, it is going to completely and fundamentally disrupt the industry. And you're going to see a lot of products disappear from shelves, um, you know, that you as a patient or you as a retailer may be used to having having in store, but just because a state regulation says that you are um, you know, fine to sell this medical product does not mean the FDA is going to have the same opinion. Yeah, no. I, and I think that, you know, getting those standards in place is obviously going to be important to trying to get to some final form of, of, of change here. Um, you know, we've got all kinds of different packaging regulations just here in Florida comparatively and things that we can do and not do um, compared to other states. Obviously, some other states have started to figure out their social consumption rules, right? And, you know, where and how those may work and, and function. Um, but you can't, you know, you can't start social consumption when you don't even have medical or adult use in place. So, you know, it's like, there's a variety of things that, that are happening, but there could be a drastic federal change that, that throws this 
although I don't think that from the comments that we said we see this drastic federal change as soon, but it's something to keep on the radar and that if it, it were to happen in, in a way that is not friendly, um, it could have some drastic negative impacts. I um, mean, maybe that can lead into one of the questions on where the medical programs fit into legalization or maybe the future of all of this. Um, unless we've kind of already addressed that, but. I mean, I think that there's, I mean, obviously there's one other thing, which I so should like, the, so federal legalization can happen in, in so many different ways, right? So like specifically like the, the most bifurcated of the two options is one under one man, federal mandate, the federal government base says, okay, generally federally it's legal, but for all intents and purposes, this thing is regulated by the states. Each state has the power to have its own, um, its own program. And like the other is that, okay, now we're gonna have a, a, an omnibus federal program and, and legislation that like dictates the rules federally. And now the states are basically subordinate in, in their regulation to the, the federal government. Um, the the fur like that's the one of the reasons why this is such a complicated issue is because like it's not one decision is not great for everyone like there, there are winners and losers from all of those decisions so specifically with a medical program right um, take like Washington's medical program versus like Colorado's medical program right Washington's basically completely withered on the vine. Colorado's kind of stagnated and and stayed more or less on a on a plane before you know slowly declining. But like one of the biggest differences between those two markets, and I'd say medical markets generally, is like the states have the ability to like tax those things differently. They have the ability to allow different like potency and different types of products to be sold relative to to those different areas. Um, and so like a, a medical licensee in and of itself, it's, if it's assuming it's not grandfathered into the rec market, probably not going to have as good a year as they had when they just kind of had medical to themselves. Um, and, but that also extends to like a, a bigger conversation about just basic climate and geography where it's like you, you have states in the country that have a comparative advantage of, uh, growing things and you have other states that simply do not so like compare i don't know georgia with alaska it's like one of one of those two states is is as a climate much better suited to, for growing a you know a plant than than the other one is much more expensive so i think you would see under federal legalization to your to your question eric is a uh probably some reallocation of assets across the nation, um, assuming that you'd have interstate commerce or uh, of some kind. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that makes sense from what I was, you know, thinking, especially based on everything that's gone on. Um, but, you know, it's going to lead to some, some potential, you know, problems if, if not, um, and even I'm sure there will be some that occur, you know, regardless. Um, I saw a question about home grow in there too. So. Yeah, we got a question about uh, what about a business that supports home grow? We should be able to grow our own for our families. Uh, and then there's a question about how can fintech, how can the fintech industry contribute to legalization? Uh, home to grow is got so like I'm just just from a from a policy perspective, right? So like. Home grow scares the shit out of most most legislators, like who are kind of novices to the industry. Like that's one of those things. It's kind of a third rail when you're talking about. So it's like, I think that's something that that comes as there's like additional comfort it, with our both our regulators and our legislators. Like that's something that will come over time. And probably the more blue the jurisdiction, or maybe the more libertarian, the better chances you are going to get for home grow. But like. It's just something that has to be socialized over the years. It's just, there's a, there, like you talk to these people, this isn't like something that I'm I, like, I, I'm for it. I, I, you know, let people grow, grow their own cannabis, but like, you, it's just, that's not a realistic thing to say in a, in a lot of states across the country. There's just, there's a lot of aversion towards that issue. And, and I would say at least on the, the federal level, how it has been dealt with. So Schumer's bill is really the only example that really even 
tangentially deals with homebrew and they require you to get a permit if you're going to be uh, distributing more than 10 pounds. Um, so it says, you know, you don't need to get a permit with the TTB um, for up to 10 pounds. Um, that, that sort of covers it. It doesn't talk about, you know, plant counts or anything like that. Um, but, you know, even at the federal level, for some of the most progressive lawmakers putting out this bill, um, they were nervous to touch it, I think, for the reasons Kristen just hit on. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's been, I, I think, in, even in some of the states, right, like in Colorado, you need to have it registered, you have plant counts, you have a variety of things that are, you know, in, included in there that, that do potentially make regulators feel more comfortable, but then all the local regulators need to be you know, either enforcing those or you have a larger enforcement body that then has to go out into all these people's, wherever they may be, um, potentially, you know, I don't know what that process looks like in every state. Um, but I mean, it, is it maybe more like some of the like microbreweries or the larger, you know, containers for alcohol to go, like those kinds of things that have come on later in the game that maybe at first didn't exist? Is that kind of how you maybe could see it come. I mean, but that's still like, if you're talking about like that microbrew model, you're still talking about like a regulated business versus like no. literal home grow. Like, a, 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 so uh, I, I just, just I, all I can speak to is like what, when I talk, when I, when I've talked to people who are like in government about these issues, like they're that issue make homegrown makes them very very uncomfortable mostly because they don't like the reality is is when you see these homegrown markets like it it's it makes regulators and legislators kind of uncomfortable but like there's not really a, the, the sky doesn't fall right so it's really kind of a question about how kind of puritanical you want to be about your drug laws but like there's a there's a certain amount of inertia with policy where you know a motion uh, an object arrest tends to stay at, at rest unless acted upon by an outside force and like it's hard to get these guys and gals to like change their preconceived notions about something like growing weed in your backyard it's it's just makes them make you know makes very yeah i think they're like oh you know how is it going to be contained is you know some kid going to break in and steal it then how are we going to deal with that um but i think you know it i think it works in some places and i think it will come along i think i agree with 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 kind of the answers that, that you all get for that but it, um, i mean the thing is is if you push it now like if if that's if that this is this is a it's a, it's an issue right so it's a policy choice and uh, another reason why this becomes a complicated conversation is because like you can agree so say specifically um say you know you have you have banking legislation and 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 say we get our two, uh, 280 problem solved but if there's people in the coalition that are like unless we get home grow we don't want any of that to happen then like okay nothing's going to happen like we're not at the point where we're going to be able to push through home growth. So you can, it's kind of like, do we take what, what we can get and continue to work or do we hold out for a, a, a pure approach, which there's, there's no evidence I've seen politically that that's, that's going to be palatable to the people we need in order to actually change laws. Yeah. And I would say that every example in every state has been incremental. So, you know, to think that, you know, all this is just going to happen and be perfect immediately on, on any front, whether it's home grow or, or some other aspect um, is, is just not going to be the case. Um, but I think now we have some examples of different places we can look to for when that comes to say, all right, what worked, what didn't, and then kind of go from there. Um, how can the FinTech industry contribute to legalization? Uh, I would say debt involved in help, help fund until we get legalization and 280 help with like debt financing while the market is down like funding these cannabis companies while it's still super hard to be profitable like giving them access to growth capital like the, the this especially for these like plucky mid-sized private companies that are still growing that aren't you know didn't get that algae bloom of of financial activity from public markets like Debt and growth capital is is big, and also you know just payment systems at these dispensaries is is a is a great opportunity too. Um, we've got uh, talk about the state of the industry in Florida, current and prospective future. 
Um, what, are the best, what are the best ways that 22 license holders can be effective encouraging political support from legislators right now? Um, and then we've got, could we speak to this? Uh, no, I already got that one. So whichever of those, oh, and how can brands and companies enter the Florida market? You wanna try and get those in in a minute or two? Or, Speed uh, round? Um, Pigford's gonna, Pigford will drop at some point soon. I think after Pigford drops, uh, we should, I, we should, we should see some movement on the applications. Although like I need to see a date on a calendar and for people specifically in the EOG to like sit up and be like, no, we're serious about this. This is actually going to happen because it's kind of been like Charlie Brown, Lucy and her football for the past three and a half years. Um, the MMTCs in Florida, um, they can do more. I mean, there's, there's, I would say probably like three or four that I would consider to be particularly politically active in a meaningful way, like probably another five or six that do basically lip service. But part of that is, um, allocating budgeting money, um, talking to your, like going to Tallahassee, talking to your uh, elected representatives, especially if you're an MNTC with like you should be on a first name basis with your local reps and your, your state senator from the area. Um, and those people uh, on a long enough political career trajectory become congressmen and women and become US senators and become governors. And like, that's, that's how you, you, know, you plant the seed and that seed grows into something bigger and, and stronger. Um, brands who wanna get into Florida, you need to find an MMTC that you like working with. Um, they are your gatekeepers right now. You want, uh, you're going to have to find good partners. Uh, and you're probably, if you're into edibles or you're the raw flower, or basically you do anything that's particularly interesting or fun with your packaging, you need to be prepared to basically have like the Dwight Schrute birthday party version of branding when you come to Florida, which is, it is your birthday, right? Happy birthday, uh, like that, that you, you have brown balloons hanging from the ceiling. Like in Florida, it's white containers. You have, uh, you have, you know, opaque containers. You, you can't see really see the product. You can't do like colorful, fun things with a lot of the packaging here. So there, there, there are plenty of brands here that have great partners with MNTCs. They're doing very well, but, um, uh, you don't get to be kind of as fun as and playful as you could in other markets speed round oh, i think i think that was good um i mean we can close it out there's a question on C hemp and cbd products the fda haven't done uh what they have or haven't done uh you know on that um you know what that transition could be litigation my, anything else relating to that yeah my speed round answer on that is the farm bill is up for reauthorization next summer um, June of 2023, there is already interest on Capitol Hill in resolving some of the issues that came out of uh, the 2018 farm bill with hemp, particularly as it relates to hemp derived intoxicating cannabinoids, so Delta 8, uh, Delta 10, uh, et cetera. Is Congress going to get it right? Probably not. Um, we're still waiting on the FDA to put forth the regulations that they were supposed to put out uh, four and a half years ago now um, for the CBD marketplace. So, uh, Members of Congress are thinking about it, um, but whether or not they're gonna actually capture uh, what's going on in retail marketplaces around the country, um, I, have my, I have my doubts. Yeah, and so my close would be, number one, thank you to, to my speakers. Number two, you know, get involved with these organizations at the national level with David, with our group, with Florida Prepare here. Um, you know, get involved with, you know, wherever you are, make sure you know your local reps and senators who works in DC versus who works at the state level. Um, you know, you can get to know some local people as well, but I think those are, those are the main ones. And then, you know, there's, it ends up being committee heads and, and leadership that are really the ones that end up, you know, having a, a, a huge, you know, part in this. So mm -hmm. as much as you want to get to know your local people, I think you also want to make sure, you know, we've been doing some doctor days in Tallahassee and a variety of other things, but I think you want to get to know who those people are going to be because when a bill gets filed, it then gets referenced to those committees of that topic, right? And so as much as 
there may be crystal balling in that. I think those are the, the, the ways that you can more target um, the people who are going to be more impactful other than just that they live close. Um, you know, in Florida, we have a super majority of Republicans. Um, I know a ton of Democrats who are great on this. There's a lot of good things that, that they have done, but, you know, they don't get the committee chairmanships of a lot of the, you know, areas that these bills get assigned to. Um, and so it's just, you kind of have to get to learn the makeup uh, of what's going on and, and make sure you're involved as these things change. And I think that was a great uh, lightning round answer from both of you guys on, on, on those questions. So without further ado, thanks again. Thank you to uh, everybody for tuning in and uh, look forward to uh, catching up with both of you at some time soon. Thanks so much, appreciate it. Right. Have a good night, y'all.